In yesterday's video, I demonstrated the Wade Tenner for 40 meters HF pedestrian mobile. The main difference to before was that I used a different antenna coupler. It's lighter, smaller, and more shielded from the weather. I didn't particularly build it for the Wade Tenner, but it worked, tuning up well on 14, 30 to 28 megahertz. It wasn't so good though on 7 and 10 megahertz though many good contacts were still had on 7. Why didn't this tune up so well? It's because the original for the RAID tenor had many more choices of inductance values with the multi-position switch compared to this which only has three inductance values 1, 3 and 8 microhenry. Another contributing factor is likely the low maximum value of the variable capacitor. At 220 picofarad, that's not quite enough for the HF bands, particularly 80 and to a lesser extent 40 meters. There's actually four variable capacitors, the main gangs as well as the two trimmers on the back. The trimmers only adjust the capacitance slightly, but it's still important if you want as low a minimum capacitance as possible which is desirable if you're building an antenna coupler that will work on 12, 10, and maybe even six meters. These two trimmer capacitors are connected in parallel with the main variable capacitors. And if you want them to be set at their lowest capacitance, then you need to adjust them so the plates are not overlapping. Back to the main variable capacitors, the maximum capacitance of one is about 60 picofarad, and the other about 160 picofarad. The middle pin is common, connected to both, and the outer pins are connected to the higher and lower value variable capacitor. You may have markings on the back, and if so, the pin marked O is the smaller value of variable capacitor, that means oscillator, and that's what that capacitor is connected to in a transistor radio, and the one marked A which is an abbreviation for antenna, is that part of the variable capacitor connected to the ferrite rod, i.e. the front end of the radio. That needed a higher value of capacitance, in this case around 160 picofarad. Of course if you wanted a higher capacitance value, a bit higher than 160, then you just join a wire between the A and the O connections, and then you have a maximum of around 220. That really helps if you're building a 40 meter antenna coupler. But if you want 80 meters, or even with some antennas on 40, then you'll need a still higher value of capacitance. This is the circuit diagram of a capacitor in parallel with the variable capacitor. It's switched, so you've got the option of having just the variable capacitor on its own, or with the increased value provided by the parallel fixed capacitor. The fixed capacitor needs to be the same as the maximum capacitance of the variable capacitor to ensure that you don't get a large gap in the capacitance range that you get. One thing you'll note when you write the frequencies of the HF bands down is there's a lot of bands between 14 and 28 megahertz and not so many lower down. And there may be times when you don't need your antenna to operate on 1.8, 5 or 10 megahertz. If you exclude those, for instance, if you are an SSB operator in most countries, then you won't need 10 megahertz. Or in some other countries, you might not have access to 5 megahertz at all. Then building an antenna coupler becomes a lot easier. Because in the case of 3.5 and 7 megahertz, there's a 2 to 1 frequency ratio between those two bands. Similarly, between 7 and 14. That means that you may not necessarily need a continuous range of capacitance or inductance in your antenna coupler to be able to properly match those bands. If you don't need continuous coverage on transmit, you may be able to take some shortcuts in the design of your antenna coupler. Or alternatively, get coverage of a large number of bands with less switching than you might expect. And if there's less switching, then that becomes a lot easier. 
because you may be able to use just a simple slide or toggle switch instead of a rotary switch. Here's a diagram of an L-match antenna coupler. There's two coils, a choice of one and three microhenry. As for the variable capacitor, there's a switch that switches between the parallel capacitor being switched out and switched in. When it's switched in, that gives the higher capacitance values necessary for lower frequency ranges. In this case, there's two independent switches, the switch controlling the capacitor and that switching the inductors. But in QRP gear, you're often wanting to save space. So instead of using two separate single pole double throw switches, like shown here, you could have it set up as a double pole switch. In other words, when the one microhenry is selected, then the parallel capacitor is switched out. And when the three microhenry is put in, then the parallel capacitor is switched in. A problem with that is you won't get as wide a range of impedances that you can match. There may be some cases where you need the switches to be out of kilter. But if you experiment, and particularly if you're not using it on bands like 5 and 10 megahertz, then you should be able to select capacitor and inductance values so that that doesn't end up being a problem in practice. For instance, we know that one microhenry should be okay on 14 through to 30 megahertz, and at those frequencies, you rarely need more than 220 picofarad as the value for the capacitor. And on seven megahertz, the three microhenry should be okay, but you may need the extra value of the capacitor. Although there will be cases, particularly with frequencies in between, like 10 megahertz, when this arrangement won't work and you need more combinations. Now the more switch contacts that the signal goes through, the greater the potential loss. So you could potentially simplify this even more. This arrangement requires just one single pole double throw switch. There are two inductors. One is one microhenry and the other is two microhenry. The reason why we're not using a three microhenry is that we still get the three microhenry setting because the inductors are in series. You're not switching between the inductors as in the previous example, but you're just switching the two microhenry inductor in and out, which gives you three in conjunction with the one microhenry. Anyway, as you can see from the diagram presented, at the moment, the 220 picofarad is switched out, the two microhenry is shorted, and you've just got the 10 to 220 picofarad. So a coupler like this should be okay on the higher HF bands, 14 through to 28 megahertz. Not sure how it would go on 10, because you'd probably need greater inductance. Not sure about seven either. Now, if you flip the switch so that instead of the two microhenry being shorted, to microhenry is in the circuit, but instead you have your 220 picofarad, then you're getting a much higher capacitance and your minimum capacitance, well the minimum here, is only 230 picofarad. So that may have problems when you're trying to match on say 10 megahertz again, but depending on your antenna, it may work on 7 megahertz. So you do have to vary the value somewhat, but something like this could be a way of having a very simple antenna coupler with very few switch settings that gives you access to a wide range of bands. But your range will be less, so you might need to adjust the antenna length as well. I haven't actually tried this, but the concept is sound, and you may be able to simplify the amount of switching you need to do for the particular bands and antennas that you use. I would suspect that loss would be a little bit less as you're only using one set of switch contacts rather than two. One thing you might wonder about is whether you should have two separate inductors or combine them on one. A problem with the latter is that if you have this setup, 
you're shorting turns and that may introduce some loss. If you look in commercial antenna couplers, you'll often see that there are multiple coils which are switched in and out with relays connected across them and that gives lower loss. Another thing you might notice is when you open the inside of antenna couplers and other RF circuitry is that coils are often at right angles to one another. That's done deliberately to minimise mutual coupling between them and potential interaction. These have been just a few comments about variable capacitors, switches and antenna couplers. They're probably not relevant if you've got a large variable capacitor, size and weight doesn't matter and you're happy to have multiple switches. On the other hand, if you want to save weight, space and are willing to compromise, like you're only going to be using a small number of bands and a limited range of antennas, then some of the compromises I've described may be helpful.